this morning, one of the things we want to do is we want to take some time because when you look at the Easter story, it's an interesting story, and it's a story that most of us in this room know very well. And so for many of us in this room, it's kind of become just autopilot. Like we just kind of go and go, yeah, Easter, Christ rose and all this stuff. And, but what does it really mean for me? Well, yeah, yeah, I know he like rose from the dead. And, and so now I get eternal life and all that stuff. But how is it practical to the situation and the circumstances and the seasons and the spaces in which I live right now? Right? If there's a single word, um, I think that the enemy tries to use more than any word in our, in our thoughts and in our um, just our lives, it is that word, look at what you've done, right? Look at that uh, mistake you made. Look at that time that you did something on the internet you shouldn't have. Look at that marriage that was lost. Look at that. Look at what you've done. And so we sit here with all this like shame and, and guilt and we, we continue to go through these things of like, well, look at what I did. Like, why do I keep overeating? Why do I keep like saying, I'll change this later. Why do I keep going to the alcohol closet? And why do I keep pulling a closet? That's kind of weird. Do you have an alcohol closet? Like you go, you go to those places that you're familiar with and you just try to like subdue the voice and it just feels like things are just dark, right? And the more we sit in that, the more we sit in this, look at what you've done. It just seems like everything just gets darker and darker and darker. And the question that we just keep asking is, look at what you've done. You. Yeah, you're a mess up. You screw up. You're a sinner, right? And you've made mistakes and you've done all those things. But I got to tell you, as you look at the resurrection story, Jesus goes, yeah, let me tell you about a guy named Peter. And let, let's walk with Peter. Let's, like, when, they, when God inspired the word of God to be written by these these writers in the gospel, like there's a, there's, a, there's a focus on Peter. And there, there's a reason for it, right? Peter, I mean, like he's one of the first that Jesus called to follow him. It says, we've been through this last few weeks. He left everything and he left everything and followed Jesus. He didn't look back. Most people say that, uh, most commentators, most scholars and all this, and if you watch The Chosen, you understand that he was, um, they uh, believe that he was the only disciple that was married, Right? And so you begin to see like all this sacrifice, all this stuff that needed to happen. You see him have some of these high, high moments where he answers the question, who do they say I am? And they say, well, you're, you're Jesus, the Messiah. And he says, oh, you, you didn't know that in your own. That was given to you by God. And so like he goes, good. And Peter, hey, I'm going to change your name to, from Simon to Peter. And now, Peter, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Now all of a sudden you're like going, oh man, this guy's like, He's pretty important. And then moments later, Jesus looks at him after he says something. He goes, get behind me, Satan. Right? So there's these ups and downs and all over. And and so we get to that last moment at the Last Supper, and we see this moment where they're interacting, and Jesus has washed their feet, and and Jesus makes a statement that there's going to be one that will deny him. And Peter goes, oh, it won't be me. Right? And Jesus goes, no, Peter, it's, it's you. You'll deny me three times, and on the third time, the rooster will crow. And so after that dinner, they go into the garden, if you remember the story, and some of them fall asleep while Jesus is in agony praying, right? And, and so we see the story begin to unfold, and as Jesus comes back to correct them, he, he steps into this moment with Peter and them, and he recognizes now the time has come. And so the soldiers are coming, and they, they look, and they ask him who he is, and obviously they say, I'm, I'm Jesus, um, that's who I am, you're, this is the one you're looking for. And then Peter does what? Anybody remember this part? Takes out his sword and he what? Chops off the ear of the servant, right? Well, what are you doing? Like, look at what you've done, Peter. Like, you just escalated this to the point of escalation. Like, whoa, like, look at what you cut the guy's ear off. This poor guy is like going, why why me? Like, I'm just here. I don't even know why I'm here. I'm just here as the servant of this guy right? And he cut his ear off. And some they say that Jesus picked up his ear and put it back on. That'd be really cool to see, okay? But what you begin to understand is if we look at Peter, Peter doesn't look that much different than us. And Peter probably was like going through some of those same emotions. He was kind of hearing those same voices. Look at what you did. And it didn't just stop there. Like, yeah, he cut the guy's ear off, right? But then it, then it gets to this point where Jesus is now drug into this, uh, into the uh, courts of the Pharisees and all this stuff, and, 
And Peter, he, he was really sneaking around there, right? And it says that he denied Jesus. He denied Jesus. And you know what's even worse? He denied him to a little girl. He was scared. He was full of fear. Because if they could do that to Jesus, I, I definitely don't want to do this. Like, I definitely don't want to get crucified. I definitely don't want to be flogged. I don't want to take the lashes. I don't want to go with anything that he's going with. And then, not just once, not just twice, but the third time, and all of a sudden you hear, cock a doo doo right? What did you do? Hey, that kind of went together, right? <laughs> he denied him three times. And after that point, we don't hear much about Peter again. We don't hear much about him through the, the crucifixion. Yeah, we see that John's there. We see that his mother Mary and the other Marys were there up through the cross, underneath the cross, all this stuff. But for some, for some reason, Peter was not in that part of the story anymore. Peter was still with him, but he just wasn't going to go that far. Peter, look at what you've done. And then, like, we find him in a place that was familiar to him. We find him in a fishing boat again. You know, a lot of times when we hear that word, look at what you've done, we kind of go back to familiar things. And some of those familiar things are things that are habits, addictions that have wreaked havoc on our life. Peter went back to something that he gave up. He just wanted to feel something he wasn't feeling right now. He, you know those emotions after you've done something and you, you have that guilt or that shame. You kind of just sit there and you're like, I just need to get away from it. I just need to get far away from this whole situation. So I'm just going to remove myself from it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to vacate reality right now. You know what I'm talking about? Peter, look at what you've done. Today, if there's nothing else that you remember from this message, there's this one quote that we've been putting on all of our Easter stuff, and it is simply this. Resurrection means that the worst thing is never the last thing. Now, some of you are like, okay, I got, like, that's really deep. I'm like, I got to think through this a minute, okay? But just listen to the words again. The resurrection means that the worst thing is never the last thing. And for Peter, it wasn't the last thing. Because we see what Christ did on that cross was not just for him, but was for you and I. And so today, before we make this transition, really what this first part of this service was, is like, how do we move from Good Friday, right, to Easter? Well, this is how. Up until this point, Peter was that guy, look what you've done. And then something changes. And that something is that, that sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for you and I. So this morning, the team's going to come and they're going to sing a song. And I, I, if I can just ask you to do this one thing. What I want you to do is this. I want you to think of that, that voice and what that voice continues to bring up in your mind. Look what you've done. And I want you to grab a hold of that and then as you hear the words to this song, I want you to say the chorus of this, which is, um, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. And that thought no longer has control of you because when you apply the blood of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. So the transition from Peter before the cross and the resurrection is drastically different than Peter after the cross and the resurrection and what you're going to see in a minute. But in order for you to make that same switch from the worst thing being the last thing to like, nope, we're not done yet, is this thing of going, okay, right now I surrender this thought, these actions to you, Jesus. So if it's something you have in a relationship that you have a lot of guilt and shame with, lay it at his feet. Because he, he paid for it a long time ago. He knew about it a long time ago. And he paid that price for you right now, right here in 2024. And he's just waiting for you. Another person said this way, take it out of the dark and expose it to the light. Take that thing that you've been hiding back there for a while and bring it before 
the one who they, they, John calls the light of the world and put it before him, let him expose it and let him show you what he thinks about it. And what he's going to tell you is I forgive you. You have been forgiven by the blood. The sacrifice I made was for you. Look at what you've done. But look at what I've done. Listen to these words.
understanding, would you just take that thing, that lie, and just pray this simple prayer. Jesus, thank you for your blood that has brought me forgiveness of my sins. I no longer have to live according to that voice. And today, I choose to listen to your voice. I choose to live for you. In Jesus' name. Have a seat. Find it interesting that when this whole story takes place, the Bible records that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it went dark, right? And like, I think that darkness, there was a physical darkness, obviously, but I think even in the life of Peter, some of the disciples, as people that have been following Jesus for many years, I think there was just kind of this doom, like gloom for a minute because it was like, Do we really truly believe who he is and who he said he was going to be? Or do we just kind of like, just go about back to our own lives and just go, well, that was a fun three years like touring, but you know, I guess we got to go back. And I think the thing that always gets me is like, what was it like from that moment where Jesus was taken off the cross and he was moved into this tomb and the tomb was sealed with this big stone? What was it like? I know I, I sit there, I mean, I, we've, I've lost loved ones, I've lost people that I've been close to, and, and it's hard. Like, you're like, okay, life is not going to be the same without them anymore. Like, and maybe some of you, that's your hiccup even too, is like, when you say, look at what you've done, maybe you left something undone, and someone died, and then you're like, what, what do I do with that now? But like, that's, that's kind of this season, this is kind of that moment, that tension that they were in. And it, it was dark. Because it was like, what, what's next? And then I, I find it interesting that the writers in many of the Gospels and then different things, it was like, and then they remembered Jesus' teachings, <laughs> right? How many of you have ever been like that? It's like, oh, I remember something that, you know, from Sunday school, that, that helped. You know, or I remember that from somebody that I saw in a commercial or something. I, I, don't rem- I just remember that. And it's like all of a sudden there was this, this, Like, okay, like maybe it is true what he said, is that he must die, then on the third day he'll rise again, and and so it's not that crazy. And so then the anticipation begins to build. It's like, okay, it's Saturday at 3, can we get to tomorrow morning? Okay, can I be there at like 11.59 to like see this happen at 12.01? Like, is it really going to happen that way? I remember when we were uh, youth pastors in uh, Detroit, uh, up in the Detroit area, during that time, the, the second set of Star Wars came out, okay? The ones that everybody's like, yeah, those aren't real, right, you know? So they're like, people disregard, the, okay, not a lot of Star Wars fans, I guess. Um, but like, I had a group of guys that we were close friends with, they're like, hey, let's go to the midnight showing. And I'm like, wait, man, I, it hits like 10 o'clock, and I'm like, done, you know? So I'm like, okay, I guess I'll go, you know? And the anticipation's all there, and, and like... They won't release the movie on, at least at these times, now they do, but they wouldn't release the movie until like 12.01 on that day. So you had to stay up and wait and wait and wait, and then you had to like go to the theater, like get your ticket, and you had to like wait in line, and you wait in the line with some really interesting people. I mean, there was people dressed up as Ewoks, there was people dressed up as um, Luke and Leia, there, I mean, it's like you get the weird people at that time. Okay, sorry if you do that. Um, anyways, um, but it was that anticipation was building. You're like, okay, I guess I can stay up. And you're getting excited because you're like, oh, I remember Star Wars from when I was little. And now they're bringing this back. And, and so, like, we, we did that. And it, it was one of those things. You're like, yeah, that was the greatest thing. And everybody was so excited about it. <clears throat> but that's kind of the feeling I feel like there is there. Now, I'm not comparing Jesus is rising again from Star Wars rising again or anything like that. But do you know what I'm saying? Like, there was this moment of anticipation. Like, is this really going to happen? And so we follow along in Scripture, and what we see is we see that early the next morning, it says, early on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday, right? While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon, who? Oh, there's that guy again. He showed up again, right? After he denied him, after he kind of went incognito for a while, like Mary goes to him and goes, hey, the stone's been re- removed, right? So Simon Peter and all the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where we put him. 
Where they put them. Not we. That's the lie. That's the thing that all the conspiracy people, oh, the disciples stole him and they hit his body and all this stuff. That's, okay, that's, we won't go there today, okay? But what we see is this. We see Simon coming back on the, in the scene. And it says this. So Simon and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. <laughs> so this is one of those moments that I truly appreciate John, okay? Because John makes this like, super humorous for all of us because basically what john's saying is peter is slower than me okay and peter didn't make it there as quick as i did and so it says that they uh they uh both were running but he outran peter to the tomb first he bent over and looked at the stripes and linens that were laying there but did not go in then simon peter came along behind him (laughs) and went straight to the tomb he saw the strips of linen laying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, the cloth was still in place, separate from the linens. Finally, the other disciple, meaning John, who's writing this, who had reached the tomb, what? Man, he's just digging it in, right? Reached the tomb first, also went inside, and he saw, and he what? Believed. Okay. Besides Peter understanding that he lost the foot race to the tomb, can you imagine when Peter gets there and he looks into the empty tomb, the feeling? Can you, can you just imagine that for a minute? There's kind of like this moment of like, oh no, but oh yes. It's kind of, he's kind of in between this moment of like, what did I do? But oh my word, look what God has done. And if God has done this, then this, is, this changes everything. But Peter also knows, like, if God has done this, and Jesus really is fulfilling what he said he would do, then, like, Peter's going to have to say sorry, <laughs> right? Like, Peter's going to have to face some things. And so the story continues as you get through this. It, it comes to this moment where, Peter and many of the disciples are out fishing again. And it says that there was this man that walked along the beach and he called out to him because they they said they hadn't caught anything all night. And so he says, hey, throw your nets over the other side. And they haul in this big fish. And one of the other disciples looked at him and says, Peter, that's Jesus. And it says that Peter immediately doesn't even think about it. I mean, think of Peter just automatically pulling the sword out, chopping off the ear. He just dives in and swims to shore. And he gets to Jesus. And can you imagine that moment with me for a minute? Like, I don't know if I'd have been so quick to go, hey, let me get in there. (laughs) Because I know at that moment I'm going to be having to face something that I did. And it says that after the disciples come in, Jesus has a fire there cooking some breakfast, and they all get in there. It says that Peter and Jesus kind of step aside. Now think about this for a minute. The smell of smoke, I've said this before, I, I... I can smell smoke on me at any place, like campfires, anybody like that? Like it sticks with you. That smell sticks with you. And so at the last time that Peter remembers denying Jesus, there would be a strong smell of what? Smoke from a fire. And then when he gets to the beach, Jesus has a fire going. I don't know about you, but certain smells bring about different memories. Anybody else? And so Jesus is at that moment with Peter, and he asked Peter just a few questions. He says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? But he doesn't just make it that vague. He does in a minute, but he starts with this, do you love me more than these? And really what he's doing is he's challenging his allegiance to like, the other disciples, do you love me more than all these other disciples? And even some people say, do you love me more than these boats and these nets and these fishes? Do you, do you love me more than these? And Jesus, or Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you, right? And then it's followed up again with two more questions, do you love me? And I don't know about you, but when someone asks you that multiple times, it's kind of insulting. But by the final one, Peter just looked, because Lord, you know I love you. But you got to think about the tone in this for a minute. 
in the languages, in the, the Greek language, in the Hebrew or the Aramaic language, when Jesus was asking one of these, do you love me, he's, he's even asking it from a different uh, word for love. He's saying, Peter, are we even friends? So think about the weight of that for a minute. Think about all that he's experienced, all that he's done, the voices that just kind of keep pestering of like, look what you did. And he's sitting here now with the Messiah, the one that he denied three times. And Jesus is asking him these things, and he asks him three times, do you love me? And then he follows it up by this simple phrase, then come and follow me. It's amazing that way back at the beginning of this whole story, when Jesus' first invitation was, come and follow me, Peter left everything and followed him. And it's amazing to me that when Peter is sitting there on the beach again, Jesus asks him this simple question again, come follow me. And Peter does. You see, today might be the day where you're sitting here as well, and you haven't been in this space for a while, or maybe you've kind of just been struggling with just your, your thoughts and all the different things that you're carrying, and you're like, you hear this voice again, and the voice is one similar to what Peter's hearing of just, do you love me? And Jesus is just following it up, going, hey, I've, I've paid the whole price. I've forgiven you. Now come follow me. Like, let's see what I can do now. There's this moment at that, that tomb that really just shapes and changes everything. And Eugene Peterson, in his book, The Practice of the Resurrection, said this way, In the wake of the empty tomb, fear gives way to courage, doubt to faith, and despair to hope. So as you can imagine, Peter peeking into that tomb just for a minute and seeing it, all of a sudden something begins to well up. There might have been these feelings of like, oh, what did I do? Like, I should have known better. Like, I, I can't believe I did that. But, or there could be this moment where this fear that he had been living in for days and, and the, the hours before this, where he's afraid of experiencing the same thing that Jesus experienced, right? <clears throat> he he now has this like fear that he's living in, but it gives way now, not to just fear, but it gives way to courage. And here's what I want to show you. This is how much Peter changes. Because in Acts chapter 2, before this we see the promise or the gift that the Holy, or Jesus wanted to give to, to us, you and I, is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it says that when the Holy Spirit came in Acts uh, 2, that they began, to, they began to go out. And I love the words and how it says it in Scripture. And it and, to me, I just got to tell you how it hits me. If Peter can move from this place of denial where he can't even tell a little girl that he's one of his followers to this place where he stands up and preaches the gospel to all these people and then I think it's 5,000 people come to know Christ that day. Like, just think of that for a minute. And it just simply says this in Acts chapter 2. It says, then, and this is under the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus just completely changed him. He says, then Peter, what? Stood up. He wasn't alone. It makes it very clear with the other 11. He stood up. Where he couldn't stand up before, now, because of Jesus, because of the resurrection, because of the promise of the Holy Spirit, because of all that God has done, like Peter can now stand up. And so fear gave way to courage because of the empty tomb. The second one we see is doubt gives way to faith. We see this in the story of Thomas. A week later, the disciples were at the house again, and Thomas was with them, and through the do though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be to you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. You see, before this, Peter wasn't going to believe it until he saw it. He basically told everybody, and not basically, he told everybody else, he goes, I'll believe it when I see it. And how I believe it is when I can put my finger in the marks on his hands and on his side. And so Jesus shows up right in the middle there and goes, here you go, right? And here's the beautiful thing for you and I. And this is where Peter's doubt turned to belief. 
It says, Tom, or sorry, Thomas. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But listen to this next part, because this applies to you and I. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Doubt gives way to belief. And the third part of that quote I want to bring you to is when despair gives way to hope. And this is probably one of my favorite parts of the resurrection story, and it's the story of of Mary. And it says this, it says, Now Mary had uh, stood outside the tomb crying. This is that moment after she had discovered that the stone had been rolled away. She didn't know what happened. She's like, thieves came and stole the body of Jesus. Like this whole thing is like crazy. And so she's just um, in complete place of despair. You talk about the darkest of dark places. Imagine at this place where she's at now, this Jesus who, if you remember her story, they say is Mary Magdalene who is freed of seven different spirits, right? And now she's like sitting in this place going, can I do life without him? And so we see this, and it says, um, she bent over and looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, and one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. She did not realize it was Jesus. Other part of my, one of the other stories where Jesus appears to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, right? It was like maybe the resurrection changed his voice like puberty does to, I don't know, anyways. Because it seemed like every time Jesus showed up, like they didn't recognize him. They didn't recognize his voice. They didn't recognize his appearance. Like there's all these different things. But it says that she was sitting there and she didn't recognize the voice, what she's talking about here. And it continues on. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? And who is this you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replies, sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. Think of the intimacy of that word for a minute. The intimacy of hearing that voice call your name. And it said she recognized his voice. And she turned around toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Her despair moved into hope. The resurrection, Easter, is a celebration of an undestructible hope that you and I have as believers in Christ. It can't be destroyed. It can't be picked apart. It's this hope that we have that he is who he said he is and he does what he says he would do. Peter knows it. Thomas knows it. Mary knows it. All these disciples know it. It says that he appeared to many people during this time in which he was on the earth after his resurrection before he ascended into heaven. And one person said it this way. If you really don't believe that Jesus is who he said he is and does what he said he would do, then just look at the people's lives that were changed because of him. If you read throughout Scripture, one of the greatest um, ways to debate somebody as far as like, is Jesus really who he said he is, is to look at his family members. And the Bible was very clear. When Jesus was on this earth, his brothers didn't believe that he was who he said he was. But yet, after the resurrection, they're now giving their lives for Jesus. Their lives are completely changed. Who is probably the most, the hardest people to, to convince about something? Your family members, right? And yet, we see James as one that would lead the church in Jerusalem, the persecuted church in Jerusalem. You see, he is who he says he is, and he does what he said he will do. And here's what I want to show you. J.I. Packer says this. He says, optimism is a wish without warrant. You're like, oh, I'm optimistic. I, I'm like, I, I, I think I believe this. Like, and I think that will just get me there. And he goes, no, let's, let's paint this picture of optimism versus hope. Okay? And he says this, 
Christian hope is a certainty, guaranteed by who? Guaranteed, okay? How many like guarantees? Yep, okay? Guaranteed by optimism reflects ignorance as to whether good things will ever actually come. Christian hope expresses knowledge that every day of his life and every moment beyond it, the believer can say with, the, with truth on the basis of God's own, what? Commitment that the best is yet to come. You see, hope, Christian hope, tells us that no matter where we're at right now, the best is yet to come because of Jesus. The worst thing is not the last thing. And so think about this for a minute. If Peter would have just went off the deep end, walked away, said, forget this, I'm out of here, all this stuff, the last thing would have been the worst thing. But it's not that because Peter, right, he stayed in there. And when he stayed close enough, what he began to see is God still had a plan for him. And think about this for a minute. Like, where would we be as a church in general if it wasn't for Peter? Like, Peter was the one that literally stepped out. He was the one that really led the early church. But I'm saying this to go, if you and I look at the last thing that you and I did, and we look at it as the worst thing, and we allow that thing to do totally take us out of life, totally take us out of things, then we're missing out on the fact that God takes the bad things and he can take them and turn them around for good for his purposes. And basically what we begin to see is God is not done with you and me. No matter what it was, whatever that last thing you did, he's not done. No matter that thing that you continue to allow to just like nag at you, persecute, whatever you want to say, like fool you, shame you, all that, it's... Jesus says, no, it's not the last thing. Because the the tomb reminds us that fear gives way to courage, despair gives way to belief, and despair gives way to hope. Because the tomb is empty. Uh, Let me say that again. The tomb is empty. Amen. And so resurrection, what we got to understand is this. Resurrection gives way to a lifelong journey of transformation. Resurrection wasn't a one-time event because Jesus promises that you and I would be resurrected. You and I would go through these moments where God is continually resurrecting us. And here's, here's the beautiful part, and this is where I've kind of just been stuck this week. This, this message probably sounds like I've been stuck this week. <laughs> Because I've been trying to lean in, God, what are you wanting, what are you trying to show us that you want to do? I think the thing that God is challenging us as a church on this Resurrection Sunday in 2024 is do we truly believe that this is the greatest news ever? Do we truly find hope in the resurrection of Jesus? And if we do, He made it very clear when he appeared to his disciples. When he appeared to his disciples, he said this simple phrase, and I think we've lost it a little bit because it's become cliche. Sorry, it's cut off there, but go into the world and preach the good news to what? Everyone. Now, let me tell you where I was stuck, okay? Go into all the world and preach the news to everyone. Right after this, Jesus makes this statement. And these are the signs that will follow those who believe. I don't see it. I don't see it in myself. I don't see it in his church. Yeah, maybe there might be pockets and all that stuff. It's kind of labeled as a little bit, some of them are kind of labeled as a little bit crazy, right? But he says, these are the signs that will follow. My prayer these last few days as I've been kind of just going through this is God May you awaken your church and may the word that you speak, may it be followed with signs. And it's not just, it says miraculous signs. I don't know about you, but our world needs to see God on display. And not in a show and not on a slanted stage and like in your workplace, in your homes. Like, has a moment that you've had recently in your family kind of put you in this place where you're like just in despair, 
Remember, the tomb goes, gives way, so despair moves to what? Hope. Or maybe you've had this moment where you, just, you find yourself just living in fear, and you're like, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. But just remember this. Like the tomb, the empty tomb gives way, so that fear leads to, I need your help because I forgot it. Courage. There we go. <laughs> Courage. You know, you have those moments, right, where you're just like, oh, I forgot, brain fart. Oh, okay, that's what I call it. Anyways. But here's what I want to challenge you with. If the resurrection really means something to you, then this is what we should be doing. We should be going into all the world and preaching the good news to everyone. And we should be believing that what will come as we do that is miraculous signs and wonders. Because in the early church, that's what we saw. Like, can we believe for that? You see, the cross, the cross was enough. We sang about it. We've listened to things about it. We have saw videos that, that talked about that being enough. So when are you able now to go, okay, what Jesus did on the cross is enough, so I don't have to continue to live in this crap hole that I'm in right now, sorry, and I can move over here to live in this full life that he is calling me into. Like, I don't have to continue to live as if the last thing was the worst thing. Like, I can move over to this place where I know that he's promised that he's going to give me everything that he said he would give me. And he's going to do exactly what he said he would do. I wish there's so many things I could get rid of over here that I did. I wish there's so many things that have happened over here that I could get rid of for people in this room. But I can't. But Jesus can. He's more than enough. And so this morning, this is where I want to leave this. Will this just be another day where we celebrate and the room's kind of full and all this stuff and, and we'll just we'll go about our lives and, and maybe come back next week or maybe the third week or whenever and, and kind of hop in and hop out? Or will we kind of come together as a church and say, no, we're going to do this and we're going to do this together? I think Kyle talked about that last week, right? How many, right, I don't know how many were here last week. But Kyle talked about community. And he talked community can only be done in proximity. Right? Peter's, Peter's downfall, if you look at the story when he denied Jesus, was he was alone. He was by himself. That's the place where you find yourself in trouble. Is when you go, I'll just do it myself. I don't want to be a burden to anybody else. No, you're call, if you're a part of this body, you're called to do this together. There's a commitment, there's a sacrifice that happens, right? You getting up today, it was a sacrifice to get here. And so it says, in, just, in the Psalms it says, we bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And for some of you, it took a lot to get here, but you're here. And today, I just want to say, like, no matter what you came with, we're offering you to live, leave with something different. But it's your choice. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Jesus, today we just thank you that we don't have to stay where we're at. We thank you through the reminder of just a simple quote that the last thing doesn't have to be the worst thing. That God, you can take any situation, any circumstance, any, anything that we've done and you can turn it around for good. I don't understand how you do that, but God, you do it. And God, your promise to us over and over and over again is that, God, you would give us full, a life to the fullest. But God, it, it begins with us truly believing that, God, no matter what was done, no matter what happened to me, no matter what I did to somebody else, God, God, your, your blood was enough. Who you are is more than enough. So that I can walk in the resurrection power of Jesus. Because your word makes it very clear, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in each and every one of us. So God, help us to tap into that power. Help us to live in that power each and every day. Help us, as Eugene Peterson says, to practice resurrection every day. 
God, we want to see you move. We want to see you move in our families. We want to see you move in our community. We want to see you move in our workplaces. We want to see you move in our schools. But God, I know that it's going to start with me being willing to say, I'm going with you. I trust you. I'm no longer fearful. I'm full of courage. I'm no longer in despair. I'm full of hope. I'm no longer doubting. I'm full of faith. So today, God, I choose to stand on that. That, I choose to make that my testimony today. That, God, you've given me courage, you've given me faith, and you've given me hope. You've marked my life with those things. And so, God, I want to go out and I want to tell others about you. And, God, I'm asking. And I'm actually, I'm standing on your word that just simply said, when those, those went out and they began to tell others about you, the signs that followed were miraculous. So God, I pray that we would understand that God, even a, a little prayer, even the courage to ask somebody to pray for them, to have a conversation about Jesus with them, could do something miraculous in a moment. God, our world needs it. Our world needs those that are full of light to shine it brightly to pull the bushel off of the basket off the light and not hide it any longer, get it to the highest point. Because darkness does not win, light does. And so today, God, we choose you. So today, if you're in this room, I'm asking you to step out of what was and move into what Jesus said is. And that's life and life to the fullest because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Would you do me a favor? Would you just tip your hands upside down and kind of put them out in front of you? And then would you just repeat this after me? Dear Jesus, here's my life. God, may I have the courage to tell others about you. May I have the faith to believe for the impossible. And may I continue to live with a hope that you give us that's indestructible. And today, God, I pray that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead would be active and alive in my life from this point forward. In Jesus' name, everybody said,